Hey guys, welcome to Read Aloud uh, 36 for day 36, November 2nd. Okay, here we go. Play something easy today. Inside Information, Chapter 12. Okay. The stars were coming out behind him in a pale blue, in a pale sky barred with black when the hobbit crept through the enchanted door and stole into the mountain. It was far easier going than he expected. There was no gob this was no goblin entrance or rough wood elves cave. It was a passage made by dwarves at the height of their wealth and skill. Straight as a ruler, smooth floored and smooth sided, going with a gentle, never varying slope direct to some distant end in the blackness below. After a while, Balin bade Bilbo good luck and stopped where he could still see the faint outline of the door, and by a trick of the echoes of the tunnel hear the rustle and of the whispering voices of the others just outside. Then the hobbit slipped on his ring and warned by and warned by the echoes to take more than hobbits care to make no sound. He crept noiselessly, noiselessly down, down, down into the dark. He was trembling with fear, but his little face was set and grim. Already he was a very different hobbit from the one that had run out without a pocket handkerchief from Bag End long ago. He, he had not had a pocket handkerchief for ages. He loosened his dagger in his sheath, tightened his belt, and went on. Now you are in for it at last, Bilbo Baggins, he said to himself. You went and put your foot right in at that night of the party, and now you have got to pull it out and pay for it. Dear me, what a fool I was and am, said the least tookish part of him. I have absolutely no use for dragon guarded treasure, and the whole lot could stay here forever. If only I could wake up and find this beastly tunnel was my own front hall at home. He did not wake up, of course, but went on, still on and on, till all sign of the door behind had faded away. He was altogether alone. Soon he thought it was beginning to feel warm. Is that a kind of glow I, s I seem to see coming right ahead down there, he thought? It was, and as he went forward, it grew and grew, till there was no doubt about it. It was a red light steadily getting redder and redder. Also, it was now undoubtedly hot in the tunnel. Wisp of vapor floated up and passed him, and he began to sweat. A sound, too, began to throb in his ears, a sort of bubbling like the noise of a large pot galloping on the fire, mixed with a rumble as of a gigantic tomcat purring. This grew to the unmistakable gurgling noise of some vast animal snoring in its sleep down there in the red glow in front of him. It was at this point that Bilbo stopped. Going on from there was the bravest thing he ever did. The tremendous things that had happened afterwards were as nothing compared to it. He fought the real battle in the tunnel alone, before he ever saw the vast danger that lay in wait. And at any rate, after a short halt, after a short, short halt to go on, he did. And you can picture him coming to the end of the tunnel, an opening of, a much of much the same size and shape as the door above, though it peeps the hobbit's little head. Before him lies the great bottommost cellar of Dungeon Hall, of the ancient dwarves right at the mountain's root. It was almost dark. It is almost dark so that it its vastness can only be dimly guessed, but rising from the near side of the rocky floor, there is a great glow, the glow of smog. There he lay, a vast red golden dragon, fast asleep, a thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail, and about him on all sides, stretching away across the unseen floors, lay countless piles of precious things, gold wrought and unwrought, gems and jewels, and silver red stained in the ruddy light. 
Smog lay with wings folded like an immeasurable bat, turned partly on one side so that the hobbit could see his underparts, and his long, pale belly crusted with gems and fragments of gold from his long line on his costly bed. Behind him, where the walls were, while the walls were nearest, could dimly be seen coats of mail, helms and axes, swords and spears hanging, and there in rows stood great jars and vessels filled with wealth that could not be guessed. To say that Bilbo's breath was taken away is no description at all. There are no words left to express his staggerment, since men changed the language that they learned of elves in the days when all the world was wonderful. Bilbo had heard tell and sing of dragon hordes before, but the splendor, the lust, the glory of such treasure had never yet come home to him. His heart was filled and pierced with enchantment and with the desire of dwarves, and he gazed motionless, almost forgetting the frightful guardian at the gold beyond price and count. His gaze for what seemed an age, before dawn, almost against his will, he stole from the shadow of the doorway across the floor to the nearest edge of the mounds of treasure. Above him the sleeping dragon lay, a dire menace even in his sleep. He grasped a great two-handed cup, as heavy as he could carry, and cast one fearful eye upwards. Smog stirred a wing, opened a claw. The rumbling of his snoring changed the note. Then Bilbo fled, but the dragon did not wake, not yet, but shifted into another dream of greed and violence, lying there in a stolen hall while the little hobbit toiled back up his long tunnel. His heart was beating and a more fevered shaking was in his legs than when he was going down, but still he clutched the cup and his chief thought was, I've done it. This will show them more like a grocer than a burglar indeed. Well, we'll hear no more of that. Nor did he. Balin was overjoyed to see the hobbit again and as delighted as he was surprised, he picked Bilbo up and carried him out into the open air. It was midnight and the clouds had covered the stars, but Bilbo lay with his eyes shut gasping and taking pleasure in the feel of the fresh air again, and hardly noticing the excitement of the dwarves or how they praised him and patted him on the back and put themselves and all their families for generations to come at his service. The dwarves were still passing the cup from hand to hand and talking delight delightedly about the recovery of their treasure when suddenly a vast rumbling woke in the mountain underneath, as if an old volcano that had made, that had made up its mind to start eruptions once again. The door behind them was pulled neatly nearly to and blocked from closing with a stone, but up the long tunnel came the dreadful echoes far from far down in the depths of a bellowing and a trampling that made the ground beneath them tremble. Then the dwarves forgot their joy and their confident boasts of a moment before and cowered down in fright. Smog was still to be reckoned with. It does not do to leave a live dragon out of your calculations if you live near him. Dragons may not have much real use for all their wealth, but they know it to an ounce as a rule, especially after long possession, and Spog, Smog was no exception. He had passed from an uneasy dream in which a warrior, altogether insignificant in size, but provided with a bitter sword and great courage, figured most unpleasantly, to a doze and from a doze to wide awakening. There was a breath of strange air in the cave. Could there be a draught from the little hole? He had never felt quite happy about it, though it was so small, and now he glared at it in suspicion and wondered why he had never blocked it up. Of late, he had half fancied that he had caught the dim echoes of a knocking sound from far above that came down through it into his lair. He stirred and stretched forth his neck to sniff. Then he missed the cup. Thieves, fire, murder, such a thing had not happened since first he came to the mountain. His rage passed just past his description, the sort of rage that is only seen when a rich folk that have had more than they can enjoy suddenly lose something that they have long had but had never once before used or wanted. His fire belched forth, the hall smoked, he shook his mountain roots, he thrust his head in vain at the little hole and then coiling his length together, roaring like thunder and underground, he sped from his deep lair through its great door out into the huge passage of the mountain palace and up towards the front gate. To hunt the whole mountain till he had caught the thief and had torn and trampled him was his one thought. He issued from the gate, the waters rose in, fierce whistling steam, and up he soared, blazing into the air and settled on the mountaintop in a spout of green and scarlet flame. 
The dwarves heard the awful rumor of his flight, and they crouched against the walls of the grassy terrace, cringing under boulders, hoping somehow to escape the frightful eyes of the hunting dragon. Things are getting a little out of control. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Recovered suddenly of their treasure, when suddenly a vast rumbling woke in the mountain underneath as if an old volcano. Wait, I already did that part, didn't I? Oh, sorry. Over here. There. There they would have all been killed if it had not been for Bilbo once again. Quick, quick, he gasped, the door, the tunnel, it's no good here. Roused by these words, they were just about to creep inside the tunnel when Buffer gave a cry. My cousins, Bomber and Bofur, we have forgotten them. They are down in the valley. They will be slain and all our ponies too, and all our stores lost, moaned the others. We can do nothing. Nonsense, said Thorin, recovering his dignity. We cannot leave them. Get inside, Mr. Baggins and Balin, and you too, Feely and Keely. The dragon shan't have all of us. Now you others, where are the ropes? Quick, be quick. Those were perhaps the worst moments they had been through yet. The horrible sounds of Smog's anger was echoing in the stony hollows far above. At any moment he might come blazing down or fly whirling round and find them there near the perilous cliff's edge, hauling madly on the ropes. Up came Bofur and still all was safe. Up came Bomber puffing and blowing while the ropes creaked and still all was safe. Up came some tools and bundles of stores, and then danger was upon them. A whirring noise was heard. A red light touched the points of standing rocks. The dragon came. They had barely time to fly back to the tunnel, pulling and dragging in their bundles, when smog came hurtling from the north, licking the mountainsides with flame, beating his great wings with a noise like a roaring wind. His hot breath shriveled the grass before them and drove through the crack they left and scorched them as they lay hid. Flickering fires leapt up and black rock shadow danced. Then darkness fell as he passed again. The ponies screamed with terror, burst their ropes and galloped off wide, wildly. The dragon swooped and turned to pursue them and was gone. That'll be the end of our poor beast, said Thor. Nothing can escape Smog once he sees it. Here we are, and here we shall have to stay, unless anyone fancies tramping the long open miles back to the river with smog on the watch. It was not a pleasant thought. They crept further down the tunnel, and there they lay, and shivered through, though it was warm and stuffy until dawn came pale through the crack of the door. Every now and again, through the night, they could hear the roar of the flying dragon grow and then pass and fade as he hunted round and round the mountainside. Okay, guys, we're going to read more tomorrow.